me about J.P. Beaumont. He was your first published mystery character. Um, how did he come to you all those years ago? Well, I spent six months trying to write the book that became Unto Proven Guilty through the wrong point of view. And on in the spring of 1982, I sent my kids to spring break camp and then I got on a train to go from Seattle to Portland to visit one of my friends from the insurance business. I got on a train with a stack of blue line notebooks and a fistful of pens and as the train pulled out of the station I thought what would happen if I wrote this book through the detective's point of view? And so I wrote the words she might have been a cute kid once that was hard to tell now. She was dead. And from that moment on, I was inside Bo's head. I was seeing the world through his point of view. I was listening to his humor and his, you know, his sort of wry, curmudgeonly way of looking at the world. <laughs> and he and, he and I have been together ever since. And I think he is, I think he's a character it is really likable. In the early books, some people are put off because he has a serious drinking problem. But somewhere along the way, about book eight, he goes into treatment, and so now there are way more books with him sober than there were with him drinking. But <laughs> that's that's how he came into my life, and that's how our lives as author and character have evolved in the past 30 years. Wow. Um, now, writing in the first you know, person... He, just one second, ahead. Mark David, I have to ask you a question. You had sure. never, never met Bo before, but you liked him, didn't you? I loved him, absolutely, absolutely. I, I want to go back and now you know, follow his story from, from day one. And I know you said in, in, in one interview that you really want your readers to read the books in order, so I, I promise that I will go okay. back to book one and, and start well, again. <laughs> I think you'll you'll see an evolution in his character, but I believe you'll also see an evolution in my writing because those were the very first books I wrote. They were published as original paperbacks. They had only the barest minimum of editing, and I think you'll find that in the past 30 years, with 5 million words of practice, <laughs> my brain has gotten a little smoother. <laughs> right. Well, actually, I was going to ask you this later, but I'll ask you this. Now, you, you tell a story somewhere or other, you've read a bunch of stuff, um, about why the chapters in your first book are so short. Do you want to share that with, with our listeners? Well, the first computer I bought, I bought with the life insurance proceeds. My, after I divorced my first husband, when I, but when I first brought him home, my parents looked at him and said, this guy is in trouble, and of course, they were right. <laughs> but my dad, who was in the life insurance business, had me buy a $50,000 life insurance policy of which I was both the owner and the beneficiary. And when I divorced my husband, that insurance policy came with me. He died of chronic alcoholism at age 42. Wow. And um, and actually, the book that will that tells that story, a book of poetry called After the Fire, will also be published, republished by Harper Collins on September 10th. But back to the short chapters. I'm sorry. When he died, okay. 18 months <laughs> after I divorced him. This fifty thousand dollars worth of life insurance proceeds came into my hands, and I took ten percent of that five thousand dollars and invented it, invested it in a an eagle computer and a daisy wheel printer. The eagle computer wasn't steam driven but it was close. It was a dual <laughs> floppy <laughs> with one hundred twenty eight k of memory. And if I wrote longer than would fit in one of their files, then then the computer would freeze up. So the chapters had to be really short. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, it, whatever works, right? <laughs> I do remember. Well, I, I adjusted that. my I adjusted my writing to the tool. Yes. Of course, yes. I didn't have that particular brand, but I also had. I think I had a K Pro, which was very similar to floppies, and I, I think I only had 64K. So you were way ahead of me. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> um, you, you mentioned a few moments ago, you know, that that certainly reading 20, 21 books over 30 years, I would notice an evolution both in the character and in your writing. Maybe you can share with us a little bit about your sense of that evolution both in your in your writing and yourself as a writer and in, and in that character. Well, I think my writing has gotten a little more graceful. I think I have a, I think I have a better command of pacing now than I did uh, in the beginning. And my my second husband, the good one, <laughs> we're coming up on our 28th anniversary right now. So he he came into my life about two years after Beaumont came into my life. So uh, we've been an interesting menage a trois for all this time. Yes, but uh, <laughs> he was he was taking some painting classes, and in in listening to what he, and he was doing it on video. And in hearing the the artist who was giving the lesson speak, I saw, I understood, in a way I hadn't before, how you have to have contrast in a piece of art. Art you have to have both light and dark. If you have strictly dark, then it's too hard for people. They don't want to go there. They don't want to stay in the dark all the time. And that's that's one of the reasons I put in Second Watch. You meet Bonnie Abney's Bernese Mountain Dog, Cracker Jack. Because mm-hmm. nobody can look at Cracker Jack and be sad. And and she <laughs> provides light in some otherwise very dark scenes. Did you get any flack early on um as a woman writer writing a male protagonist, especially in the first person. Well, of course I did. That's how Judith Jones became J. A. Because <laughs> <laughs> because my the marketing people at my initial publisher, Avon Books, didn't think male readers would accept a police procedural written by somebody named Judy. And mm-hmm. of course they obviously hadn't looked at my next door neighbor on the mystery show P. D. James who is <laughs> P.D. for exactly the same reason. And right. P.D. James is not only my neighbor on the bookshelves, she's also my role model. I want to be P.D. James when I grow up and still be writing <laughs> and selling mysteries when I'm in my 90s. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sad to say, in a sense, that that concern by publishers about women writers um, writing <sighs> quote, male books still exist. I interviewed a, um, a thriller writer um, last month, Dorothy McIntosh, who writes under the name D.J. McIntosh, still just starting out now for that very same reason. So think times have yes. not changed as much as we might like them times, to have. Times have not changed that much. My early books, those early Beaumont books, the first six of them, in fact, were published with no author photo and no author bio. And that gave rise to the rumor in Seattle that a retired Seattle homicide cop writes these books. I thought that rumor would go away when they started putting my my picture on the books. It has not. Now they simply say, a retired Seattle homicide cop writes these books and she's just a front for him. Right. They don't say that he had a sex change operation, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, people say, "Well, how do you, how do you know how to write a male point of view so accurately?" Well, for 18 years of my life, I tried to figure out what made the guys in the bars so much more interesting to my husband than I was. And so I went to the <laughs> bars with him. I listened to how those guys talk. I tried to understand what made them tick. And when it's time to write a Beaumont book, I just send my head back to those places. In in Second Watch, 
Beaumont, we'll meet Beaumont as he is now and as he was when he was a much younger man. And at the beginning of this book, in the prologue, he is being driven to a hospital here in Seattle for a dual knee replacement surgery. Well, I'm lazy. I don't make up everything. I use as much real stuff as I can. And five (laughs) years ago, my husband, Bill, had dual knee replacement surgery. And I drove him to the hospital. So on the way to the hospital, Bo was thinking, okay, if I croak out in the course of this operation, and if this is my last time to be with Melissa Soames, Mel Soames, his wife, then I really want to tell her how much she means to me and how much I want her life to be perfect. And, of course, she's a man. Does he say any of those things? Absolutely not. So Bill read the prologue. He looked at me and he wiped a tear from his eye. And he said, how did you know that was what I was thinking on the way to the hospital? (laughs) Well, duh. (laughs) That's awesome. I mean, the second watch, we'll come back to some of those stories in the second watch. The second watch is full of stories like that where where you pulled out something that was real without even knowing. But I have to ask you if you drove Bill to the hospital in a Porsche. Oh, no, no. I did not drive him in the Porsche. No. The, <laughs> we bought the Porsche but the por- and, and we drove the Porsche. But, you know, as, when your body reaches a certain <laughs> stage. You need comfort. I drove him to the hospital in the Mercedes. And you know, oh. my creative writing professor in Tucson is long dead, but he was probably rolling over in his grave. <laughs> well, in fact, let's talk about the creative, that creative writing professor because apparently you turned him into a... Um, uh, was it a serial killer or something in uh, one of your yes, in uh, our, Walker in Hour of the story? Hunter, in Hour of the Hunter yeah. and and Kiss of the Bees, the first two Walker family books. Yep, Andrew Philip Carlyle is a very scary guy. Who says writers don't have the best revenge? <laughs> so tell us, because not everybody might, might might know the story. Tell us about him, his real life persona, and then what you what 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 the revenge was. Well, I I wasn't allowed in the creative writing program. He told me in 1964, girls become teachers or nurses, boys become writers. And my first husband was allowed in the course that was closed to me. So in Or of the Hunter, Diana Ladd has a husband just like mine. He's dead at the beginning of the book. And the crazed killer in that book and also in in Kids with the Bees is a former professor of creative writing from the U of A, University of Arizona. Uh-huh. I don't use him exactly, but in my heart, him. it was him. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge is sweet. <laughs> so let's, come, let's, let's zoom back to the present day, and um, you've given us a little bit about Second Watch. Tell, tell us more about the main story, and also let's start talking a little bit about that that secondary plot that is that is that is so moving. Well, I was um, it, I finished the Joanna Brady book tour for Judgment Call, and it was time to write a Beaumont book. And one of my sons had given had made the suggestion that maybe I could write a Beaumont prequel because. My son is a 40-something who thinks Bo is getting a little too long in the tooth. So (laughs) I didn't much like that remark, but when it was time to write the book, writing a prequel was the only idea I had. So I write in a chair in my family room. I was sitting there, and I thought, okay, what if I write a prequel? So if I'm going to write something that happened before Until Proven Guilty, then I better find out what I say in Until Proven Guilty. So I got a copy of that book, and I started scanning through it, and my heart snagged on the word Vietnam. And all of a sudden, I was transported back to Bisbee High School, Bisbee, Arizona, early 60s, 
where the guy in the class ahead of me was this amazing young man named Doug Davis. He was tall, he was smart, he was handsome, he was an outstanding athlete, graduated as valedictorian of his class, went from Bisbee High School to West Point, went from West Point to Ranger School, went from Ranger School to Vietnam, where on the 2nd of August of 1966, weeks before his 23rd birthday, he died. And I was sitting there and I thought, Doug Davis would have been a year older than J.P. Beaumont. What if I have him be Bo's commanding officer in in this book? So over the years, I had met Bonnie McLean Abney, who was engaged to Doug at the time he was married. He was, he was killed. And she and I became friends and acquaintances because in one of the Joanna Brady books, I used the same cemetery in Bisbee, Arizona, where Doug was, was buried. So... I sent Bonnie an email and said, I'm thinking about writing a book and having Doug and Bo appear in it together. Do you think this will work? She said yes. And so she started sending me material. She sent me the letter she wrote about her first visit visit to Bisbee after Doug was dead. She sent me the letters of condolence from his fellow officers and his commanding officer and eventually, I had all of this stuff, and it was time for me to start writing. And so when when my husband had his dual knee replacement surgery, he had, they gave him drugs, and so he was very happy while he was in the hospital, but he also <laughs> had really vivid dreams. And so when Bo goes in for his dual knee replacement, the same thing happens to him. These two characters appear in his drug befuddled brain. One of them is Monica Wellington, the girl who was murdered in the first homicide investigation he ever did in the 70s. And the other is Doug Davis, who was his commanding officer in a fictional version of Doug's life. In the in Bo's room, he wakes up, or at least he thinks he does, and this guy walks into his room and and lays four playing cards down on Bo's hospital table. And as soon as, as Bo sees them, he knows without turning them over that they're all going to be aces of spades. And so he and, and Doug have this interesting conversation when I sent the manuscript to Bonnie after the whole book was written, she said, I had to read that scene over and over. She said, you captured him so completely in those few breaststrokes that it was as though he had walked back into my life. Wow. So what is... So Monica comes to to Bo and... Um, well, she's up, Monica is upset because he he didn't keep the promise he made to her mother that they that he'd find out who did it. My my uh-huh. editor read that prologue and she said, "Doesn't Judy Chance realize she's supposed to be writing a murder mystery and she's going to put that her protagonist in the hospital flat on his back?" <laughs> but, but pretty soon he has. A murder to solve, a cold case, and he has a mission. Doug Davis asked him, what are you in here for? And Bo said, well, I'm having my knees replaced. And the dreamscape Doug Davis said, they can do that now? (laughs) And then he says, what have you done with your life? And Bo explains that he's been a homicide cop most of his life. And Doug Davis says, married? And Bo gives the short history of his checkered marital past. <laughs> and Judge Davis said, I had a girl once. I don't know if I ever told her 
how much she meant to me. And now Bo, still in the hospital, has a murder and a mission to find this unnamed girl, Bonnie Abney, a girl he's never reached out to in all the intervening years, to give her Doug's message. Hmm. Now, Doug has, has saved Bo's, in, 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 in Vietnam, in the fictional Vietnam, Doug has saved Bo's life in a very unusual way, and it's, there was a real-life counterpart to that, too, wasn't there? Can you, can you share that? Well, I'm I'm sorry, I don't exactly understand the question. Is it- oh, sure. Um, the um, the book that, that Doug lends, um, or actually insists that Bo read in Vietnam, is what saves his life. And I did read somewhere that, that that you you came across a Vietnam vet who had a similar experience. It, it actually. After we finished, after I finished writing the book, and sent it to Bonnie, we wrote the piece that's at the back of the novel, the, the story mm-hmm. behind Second Watch, right. because so many interesting things happened to us, both of us, in the course of the detective work we did as we were as as I was writing this book. She sent it to some of the people who had been with Doug. Lenny D, as his his fellow soldiers called him, um, in Vietnam, one of those guys went down to his basement and found a photo he took of Doug in Vietnam two days before he died. And that photo, of, he sent it to us. It was a photo Bonnie had never seen. It's the photo that's in the book. But what he said to Bonnie is, I felt guilty all these years that I never reached out to you when we came home. When it, These days, when soldiers come home from being deployed to wherever they're deployed, they're, we see the, the welcome home video on the news, and there are brass bands, and there are flags, and there are are our, our balloons, but when the guys came home from Vietnam, there were no brass bands. And this book, in my heart, has become a literary thank you note to all of the guys who served back then, who came home to be spat upon and reviled, whose, whose loved ones were dismissed because their son was a, quote, baby killer, unquote. This is a literary thank you note to all those guys, the ones who served at that time, the ones who came back, as well as the ones like Doug Davis who did not. Mm-hmm. I mean, the story you tell, I mean, the, the murder, I mean, obviously it's a murder story, and the Monica story is is the main plot but the but the the this subplot involving Doug and Bo and Bonnie is just it's incredibly compelling and it's and it's incredibly moving um it's it's, it's by the time i get to the copy editing stage of writing a book i've been through the material so many times that it's just It's a job. I have to get through these words and make sure there are no spelling errors. But this book still, even at the the, um, galley stage, has the power to move me to tears. And I I think that's... I I wrote it. I think that's kind of surprising. (laughs) Well, one of my favorite quotes from Ray Bradbury, um, I don't know where I saw this, he said something like, if I cry at my own writing, I know it's good. Um, and so I think, you know, if if having read something, I mean, I know how many times one reads one's own work getting it to the publishing stage, dozens and dozens of times from the first from the first draft to the end, and it still moves you. I mean, that's 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 a huge. I think it's a huge testament to the story and to your and and also to your ability to convey it powerfully. So. 
So good on you. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. Well, I think I think this book became far more of a passion for me because it was a way to honor both Doug and Bonnie. It became a passion in a way that writing some of my bo- other books is more like a job. Mm-hmm. But I that I I still am harking back to that moment less than a year ago, right this minute. Well, by the time this is is it's less than a year yeah. ago because it, we're recording this, but it'll be only two months after I had that moment of what feels like divine inspiration when I thought, what if I put them both in the same book? Mm-hmm. Well, it's it was it was a brilliant stroke, and um, I like to joke when I'm writing that my book knows a whole lot more about itself than I do. And it sounds like that was certainly the case here with you as well, um, being pulled into this again to this, the secondary story. So, how much of the of the the Bonnie Doug bow, well, I guess the Bonnie Doug really part, is fact, and how much is fiction, or can you even tell anymore? Well. The part about the Ace of Spades was true. When mm-hmm. when Doug and when Doug and I were growing up, uh, Mrs. Philippi was a librarian at Bisbee High School, and when she would unlock the library doors in the morning, both Doug and I would be milling outside, waiting to get in, and I would go straight to fiction, and he would go straight to history. He is the only kid from Bisbee High School who always who checked out and read all the volumes of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. So he was still a reader in Vietnam. And he did carry this tattered copy of The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And, of course, Bo's guilt is partially that Doug is dead and he is not, not through an act of heroism on Doug's part, but through a simple act of kindness. So the Ace of Spades part is true. Doug and his fellow officers wrote to the player card company and the CEO produced boxes, decks of cards that contain nothing but Aces of Spades. Uh, All of that is true. And Cracker Jack is true, right? Is, 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 Cracker is the real, Jack is, is the real true. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you now that the flag part at the end, where Bonnie mm-hmm. is given the flag, is also mm-hmm. true now, because before Bill and I left Biz- Arizona this spring, we went to Bisbee High School, retired their flag, and gave it to Bonnie wow. in in a presentation box. We also went to a guy named Michael G. Reagan, no relation to the <laughs> former President Reagan, um, who has a company called the Fallen Heroes Project. And he did a pencil portrait of Doug based on that long lost 40 year old picture and we gave Bonnie her flag and her portrait of Doug and it felt in my heart as though I had helped bring him home mm. you, the, the story the, the scene you paint in, in the book where um, Bonnie uh, watches the train arrive in Bisbee with, 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 with Doug's body uh, or outside Bisbee, I guess, with Doug's body to avoid protesters, again, was, was, was very, very moving. And I understand that. Um, and that was absolutely true. Yeah. And I understand that, that, that you missed the real Doug's funeral as well. I did. I missed the real Doug's funeral. And, and I felt guilty about that for all these years. But having written this book, and made him this has been Bonnie's private pain all all these years and i 
it's been it's going to be really challenging for her to allow that pain to be made so incredibly public. Of course. But I know I no longer feel guilty about missing the funeral because I have honored both of them in a way that only a writer who knew them both could. Right. Well, and it's almost as though, you know, it's it's you're mirroring you're mirroring, not surprisingly, as as his creator. Um Bo's getting rid of his guilt as well by by doing what he had to do to uh, to bring bring to completion that 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 chapter in his life. Well, Bo and I have been together for all these years, and I never knew he had Purple Heart down in the basement. He never mentioned it to me. <laughs> I love that because um, one of the one of the joys I think uh, for me at least of writing that sounds like it is for you as well is is not so much writing what I know about these people but discovering what they have to tell me about themselves. Right, that's absolutely true. I I need to tell you one more piece of this. After I had written that that first scene with uh, with Doug and after I knew how Doug had saved. Bo's life by by mm-hmm. lending him a book. I went to Lincoln City and I met a young man, a Marine, who had been out jogging on the beach, and he's and so we were chatting and he said, "Yes, I've I've been out jogging on the beach for uh, thirty minutes because I'm recovering from dual knee replacement surgery," <laughs> and I'm. <laughs> And I'm hoping to get back to active duty. And I looked at him, and he was only, he couldn't have been more than 20 years old. And I thought, aren't you about 40 years too young to have dual knee replacement surgery? But he said, um, he explained that he was in Afghanistan. He was reading one of my books. And when the bullets came in to his vehicle, they hit the book first. And that was why there was enough of both of his knees left that they could rebuild them, replace them, rather than having to amputate both his legs. And, and that, having, of course, is, is, that that's how Bo's life is saved, right? With, uh, because the bullets... That's his, right. The bullets... The book that Doug because, has lent him. But I thought I was writing something that was totally fictional and to find find Reese Emery and have him tell me about his experience. It just absolutely made the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. Right. Well, it's, you know, it seems like, like this book is filled with situations, stories like that, that uh, where, you know, you as the writer are tapping into something that you're not even aware of that, you know, truth that exists that's that, that's beyond you and beyond the book that is, but is but is there nonetheless. It's. Um... It, I, you're right. I feel like I'm tapping into something that's out there. People ask you, where do you get your ideas? Well, I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> but these these are the ideas for one book, and and collecting. The ideas for each book is a process that's not unlike this one. I sort of step off the edge at the beginning. I do not outline. I met outlining in Mrs. Watkins' sixth grade geography class. I hated it then. I hate it now. So uh, because I write murder mysteries, I usually start with somebody dead, and then I spend the rest of the book trying to figure out who did it and how come. So... I have to sort of step out with faith that if I can write the first sentence in a book, I can eventually, 100,000 words later, get to the end of it. (laughs) (laughs) I so love that because I don't outline either, and um, I will often tell the story in in, in talks and and workshops that when I was in in high school or or college and I had to hand in an, an outline, I would write the essay first and the outline afterwards from the essay and then hand it in together. Um, and everyone goes, you know, <laughs> and then they all then, then they all breathe a sigh of relief. What well, I, I, I I think what I, what go ahead. Being told that you have to outline 
and, and making that be a requirement is really, as far as I'm concerned, a way of stifling creativity and giving your imagination free reign. I, it, people tell me that they don't stick to the outlines. Well, then why write outlines? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with you 110% on that, absolutely. But I do want to ask because a murder mystery is a little bit different, you know, than maybe a different kind of novel where there is a there is a murder, there is a mystery, and it has to get solved, and clues have to get planted. So, if you're not outlining, which is awesome, and if you're if you're discovering as we are, which is which is what Stephen King does, what's happening in the story, do you then have to go back in in future drafts and you know make sure those clues are present, or do they kind of appear of their own as you're Actually, writing? Actually, I was I was writing the second Beaumont book, a book called Injustice for All. And 70 books from the end, the person I thought had done it the whole way along couldn't have done it. He wasn't there. And <laughs> I remember arguing with him in my my little green computer screen. I said, what do you mean you didn't do it? <laughs> and people asked me later, well, didn't you have to go back and change the clue? I said, no, he was innocent the whole time. <laughs> And I love oh, that no. story, too, because I, I I finished a book, and in the, on the, like 10 minutes before I finished the, the first draft, I discovered something quite startling about the, the, the um, antagonist. And I thought, oh, you know, and it was great. I thought, oh, damn, I'm going to have to go back and fix everything to make it work. I didn't have to fix anything at all. It was there all along. I just hadn't seen it. So it's the same right. Case. That the book is the book is writing itself for you. You just have to go along for the ride. It's a it's it's a process of just, it sounds like for you as well as for me, writing the book is a process of discovery. And sometimes yeah. when I'm I'm toward the end of a book and I'm really struggling and I can't I have a problem with the motivation. And until I get mm-hmm. the the bad guy's motivation sorted out I can't go ahead and finish the book. I may I may I speak for a brief moment about yeah. After the Fire. After the Fire yeah. is a book of poetry. It's being I can't believe this. It's being reissued by a New York publisher and they actually paid me for it. <laughs> <laughs> It goes it goes on sale on the 10th of September, the same day uh, Second Watch does. When I was married to my first husband, he told me in 1968 there was only going to be one writer in our family, and he was it. And so because I wanted to be married, I put my own writing ambitions on hold. And other than writing little bits of poetry under the dark of night while he was passed on it out cold in his chair. I didn't do any writing for years and years. And I I would jot up these little poems and I would hide them away in the strong box, a place I knew he would never look because I wasn't supposed to be a writer. At the time, I thought I was being true to my art. But in actual fact, I was dealing with words, with the central issues in my life. When mm-hmm. he died in 1982, I went back, I had to go to the strong box to get out the um, marriage certificates and the divorce decree and the birth certificates and all of those pieces of paper that you have to have, official pieces, you have to have when someone dies. And there I found all these snippets of poetry. And as I read through them, I could see it was like seeing my life in instant replay. The title of the book is After the Fire, and the title poem goes like this. I have touched the fire. It burned me, but I knew I lived. It seared me, but it made me whole. He called me. I went gladly, though I saw the rocks still laughing through the singeing air. I have known the fire. I'll live with nothing rather than with less. The flame is out. 
There's nothing left but ash. Mm. That post oh, is an all occasion greeting card to <laughs> people who are stuck in, in hopeless situations. Right. I'm sorry. How did you feel when you when you opened that, that, that strong box after all those years not having seen those poems and began to read them again? Well, I was astonished because clearly I wasn't it wasn't art. I was struggling with trying to figure out why he loved booze more than me. Mm-hmm. Uh my my rival is a fiery golden dame whose wanton touch caresses care away and makes a stranger of my lover's heart and soul. Mm. I, those, I was fighting booze, and I didn't sure. even know it. And... There's there's the poem I wrote the morning after he moved out of the house. I like the green ones best. I count them up as any miser would and watch them grow with satisfaction. For they are the tangible symbol of what is processed here. Lettuce, toilet paper, mm. pork, and beans. Mm. And it's it's a poem about collecting gold bonds or green green stamps, S N H green stamps. Because at that point in March of nineteen eighty three or I'm sorry, of March of nineteen eighty, my marriage was over. I thought the best I could ever do was collect trading stamps and I hadn't written a single book. I think I think After the Fire is an important book because it it shows that yes, you live through a dark chapter, and then you get to live in light chapters. So, is there a reason why it was decided that both Second Watch and After the Fire would release on the same day? I think they're hoping that people who buy one will buy the other. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that too. That works. <laughs> but. But in a very real way, After the Fire is my autobiography. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it chronicles 18 years of my life. And the thing is, those 18 years were filled with interesting and tough experiences. But they turned me into who I am today. Of course. It gave me a, a... a level of, we were in Hammond, Indiana, and my first husband loved to go to really divey bars. And one <laughs> hot summer's night, I was out standing behind a tree because a, a gunfight had broken out in, in the bar. So, you know, that gives you a lot of impetus to be a mystery writer, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, I sure. wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the kind of, uh, I think, sort of wise person I am today if I hadn't seen and made some very bad choices along the way. (laughs) 